Uh, this morning I'd like to um, just provide an overview of motor neuron disease ALS, talk about some clinical features that we look for, how we diagnose motor neuron disease and some of the research that we've been doing um, to uncover what uh, causes motor neuron disease with implications for potential future therapies. As you all know, motor neuron disease or ALS was diagnosed a long time ago in the 19th century by the fam uh, famous French neurologist Charcot. Um, and he described this, I think, in about the 1870s. And it was Charcot who first coined the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis to describe two phenomena that he was observing. The first one was that there was uh, atrophy or degeneration of the motor neurons, the nerves that move your uh, muscles and, may, and help you breathe. Uh, but together with that, there was also hardening and sclerosis of these uh, lateral tracts. Let me just see if this, uh, of these, fibers here that connect the brain to these uh, motor neurons. So if you tell your brain to move your finger, it's these neurons that um, um, send the information uh, to the uh, finger. Now, that, that was a quite an important observation, and Charcot himself said, well, there's something unusual is happening here, and he proposed the original theory that perhaps motor neuron disease starts in the brain, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, why one gets motor neuron disease. MNDALS is quite an interesting disorder. It's probably the commonest of all the acquired motor neuron uh, diseases. Uh, in the USA, it's uh, known by the name Lou Gehrig's disease because of this famous New York Yankees uh, uh, player who died from motor neuron disease at the age of uh, 38. Um, in Australia, we've had our, sorry, we've had other famous people suffer and die from motor neuron disease. Scott Gale was uh, a, a notable uh, person who uh, was who played for the Western, uh, well, the Balmain Tigers, which are now the Western Sydney uh, Tigers. He died at a very young age, and uh, Prohart also died from motor neuron disease. So motor neuron disease does not discriminate; it, it affects the sort of the, the, the cross-section of our society, but it seems to be somewhat more prevalent in sports people. Uh, there was a study uh, performed by Alessandro Chio in, uh, the, in 2005, and he uh, found that motor neuron disease was more prevalent in Italian soccer players, perhaps suggesting that there's something to do with your being more active. Uh, and we've certainly, I've seen a lot of players, a lot of patients who've played rugby league at a semi-professional uh, level, rugby league or rugby union at a semi-professional level. I don't quite understand the link there. But when we talk about motor neuron disease, it is not one disorder. There is a heterogeneity in presentation uh, and a heterogeneity from person to person. So it can, motor neuron disease can spread from a predominantly lower motor neuron form where one has just progressive muscle wasting and weakness without brisk reflexes, and that's called progressive muscular atrophy, through to this Charcot's ALS, where you have mixed upper and lower motor neuron involvement. This is the commonest form uh, of motor neuron disease, and that's the form of motor neuron disease that everybody uh, uh, associates with uh, an adverse prognosis and what we when we think about motor neuron disease, we think about that. And then right through here is the so-called predominantly upper motor neuron form of primary lateral sclerosis, where those nerves, the corticomotor neurons that connect the brain to your spinal cord are predominantly affected. Now at the polar extremes, the PMA and the PLS, uh, uh, these uh, forms have uh, a better prognosis. They have a slower uh, progressive di disease course for whatever reason. And I think if we could uncover what that, those reasons are, uh, th that would be quite important in developing a treatment strategy. Uh, more recently, motor neuron disease has not, uh, has, we've changed in the way that we think about this disorder from being a purely neuromuscular disorder to being a neurodegenerative disorder and really affecting the whole motor system, starting from the frontal lobes in the brain right through down to the uh, spinal cord. There's an overlap between ALS and frontotemporal dementia and the recent genetic discovery, which I'll talk about, the CNINORF gene underscores that. So what, what about the prevalence? Well, in its commonest forms, the ALS or the Charcot's form of motor neuron disease, the prevalence is about four to six per 100,000. 
and there are about 12 to 1400 cases in Australia in any one time. The median survival was about three to five uh, years. And if I was giving this lecture, say, 12 months ago, I would say that one Australian dies from this condition uh, every day. But that's been doubled now. So two Australians die from this condition every day. Now, how do we diagnose this condition? Now, it is very difficult to diagnose because it is often under-recognized, not only by general practitioners and other non-neurologists, but even uh, neurologists themselves. And part of the problem is that there is no one test that can tell you, well, this is motor neuron disease. And that's why there's a lot of uh, umming and hiring and uncertainty from uh, neurologists, even those neurologists who uh, see uh, motor neuron disease patients. But at the crux of the diagnosis is finding a combination of what we refer to as upper and lower motor neuron signs. So upper motor neuron signs are you know, very brisk reflexes, increased tone, uh, a funny speech or what we call a spastic speech which signifies involvement of these corticomotor neuronal fibers, these nerves that connect the brain to the motor neurons. Together with muscle wasting, weakness, muscle twitching or uh, fasciculations. So you need to have a combination of these uh, two clinical features in one region. Uh, arm is one region, a leg is another region uh, to make the diagnosis. This is why taking a proper history and examining, and examining the patients thoroughly uh, is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, and uh, based on that, people have developed various criteria. You would have heard of the ellis Coriel criteria, which looks at a specific level of uh, certainty. These are mostly research criteria, uh, and in, in clinical practice, they provide uh, guidance. Um, and again, what they stress is that you might, you have to find these upper and lower motor neuron features in a number of different regions. The other thing that is also important is progression. So sometimes when you see a neurologist, they may not be sure uh, whether you have motor neuron disease or not. And people don't want to jump at, at that diagnosis because of the, of the all, all sorts of implications that it has. So often what we will do is say, well, let's see how the disease evolves over the next three to six months. And invariably, motor neuron disease has this characteristic in its typical form, the ALS form, to progress over a period of six months. So this is what somebody with motor neuron disease looks like. Typically one sees wasting of the hands, you see wasting of the tongue and twitching of the tongue, you see wasting of the muscles around the shoulder girdle, okay, um, and around the sort of the front of the shoulder. So it's a progressive uh, motor uh, syndrome. One unique feature of motor neuron disease is what we refer to as the split hand. So the split hand refers to this funny pattern of wasting um, in ALS, which is almost, almost specific for this uh, disorder, whereby the lateral part of the hand, this, here, this muscle here is called the first dorsal interosseus, and the thumb part, the thinner eminence here, become preferentially wasted when compared to the sort of me more medial part of the uh, hand. Now, that's despite the fact that all of these are innervated by the same spinal cord segment. Now, th this observation not only is important from a diagnostic aspect, but it's also important from understanding what drives motor neuron disease, which I'll uh, uh, get to in a second, but suffice to say, People around the world now believe that this split hand is driven by uh, pathology up in the uh, cortex. The, these, this muscle and this muscle has a much greater representation in the hand because you need it for fine motor tasks than this part. Now, because we were so, well, we weren't that good at diagnosing motor neuron disease, certainly not in a timely fashion, uh, it takes approximately 14 months uh, on average to make a firm diagnosis which has implications for, for treatment trials and also giving patients certainty and starting appropriate management. Uh, in 2008 a consensus criteria was formed by all of these famous um, ALS physicians. Memo de Cavallo is from uh, Portugal, Michael Swash is from England and uh, Andrew Ison is uh, I'll get to him in a, in, in a moment, but uh, they came and developed uh, or proposed a novel um, 
diagnostic criteria. So what they've said was, okay, it's fair enough to examine the patient, and you should, but we should also find, uh, we should also use more objective uh, measures. So one of the objective measures of nerve loss that we have is uh, a nerve conduction study EMG machine. How many, ha how many of you had nerve conductions EMG? That terrible test. Well, that's really uh, the only, well, I won't say the only, but it's the most practical and the most implemented plan or, or investigation of documenting lower motor neuron loss. So what this consensus criteria said was, well, okay, if you can't find clinical evidence of lower motor neuron loss, it's enough to find electrical evidence. So sometimes the muscle can look strong, but if you put a needle in there, there, is subclinic, there are subclinical changes. So they said, you can use that as a, as a diagnostic uh, point. And they also said, in addition to showing the typical features of nerve loss, which are called fibrillation potentials and positive sharp waves, which I'll show in a moment, even if the muscle twitches, that's enough to say that this is a diagnostic point. Well, this was proposed in, I think, 2008. And um, there have been a number of mostly retrospective studies that, are, that have been single center that have looked at the diagnostic utility of, of this test. And it certainly improves the diagnostic, uh, qual uh, uh, diagnostic quality as compared to the Elescorio criteria, but it's by no means perfect. And one of the major reasons is that, you know, lower motor neuron involvement still is uh, clinical. So we're actually heading up a, a, a consortium now to do a, what we call a meta-analysis to see how useful this test is uh, and whether or not modifications are, uh, are required. I, I know that the, there, a German group has proposed a modification of, this, of these criteria. So clearly there are, there are issues with, di with diagnosing motor neuron disease. And part of the issue is that the, the conditions that can mimic or look like motor neuron disorders are so vast, as you can see here. A uh, number of different conditions, including what we call uh, autoimmune neuropathy, a condition called multifocal motor neuropathy, CIDP, cramp fasciculation syndrome, and so on. All of these things can look like motor neuron disease. And you don't want to miss this because they are treatable. If you miss it, uh, and you uh, don't treat it at the, uh, on the, at the right point in time, you can get irreversible nerve loss even from these conditions and uh, people will be rightly unhappy with you. But it's also important to exclude other conditions like myasthenia gravis, various disorders of muscle, and importantly, various structural lesions. So when I see a patient with motor neuron disease, apart from doing a detailed clinical history and an examination, um, we also do uh, these whole host of tests, including nerve conduction studies, EMG, but uh, MRI of the brain and the whole spinal cord uh, is a must. And this is what uh, uh, a nerve conduction study looks like. So this is a healthy motor neuron. This is a motor neuron that's dying. So if you put a needle in there, uh, the, this death signal is indicated by these little potentials called positive, uh, these are fibrillation potentials and positive sharp waves. It just tells you that the muscles there have lost their nerve supply and if you wait for about three months, the, the, this nerve tries to sort of remodel, tries to grow back onto the muscle and you get these so-called chronic neurogenic changes, the big motor units uh, that are polyphasic. So that tells you that there is what we call chronic damage. You, you need both one and two uh, to be sure that this is motor neuron disease. And that's just an MRI, usually is used to exclude uh, other uh, conditions, but rarely you can find, see this thing here, these white, sort of these hyper intensities or white spots, that's the degeneration of the corticomotor neuronal system. Unfortunately, that's not very specific or sensitive for motor neuron disease. And speaking to some of my colleagues who are interested in more uh, update, uh, up to date uh, MRI technologies. The biggest problem is that there is variability from person to person that prevents us from using these techniques uh, uh, as a routine diagnostic test to pick up MRI signals. So once we've made the diagnosis, well, what about the, the pathophysiologies? Why do people get motor neuron disease?
Well, the short answer is we don't know. Um, there are, uh, you know, there's emerging evidence of a genetic predisposition. A number of genes have been described. Uh, the C9 North, I haven't updated here, but uh, may, approximately 10% of the apparently sporadic forms of motor neuron disease will have a, a, a genetic etiology or, or a genetic predisposition. But being born with the, the gene does not necessarily mean that you will get the disease, and it doesn't predict when you will get the disease. Uh, so there are clearly other factors involved in uh, triggering uh, in triggering the, the, de the degenerative process of the neurons. Genes are very, very important. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, over the next 10 years, we'll have a, another 100 genes, and some of these will be uh, personalized to various families. Uh, but they, they are predisposing uh, factors and are important in telling us what's going on uh, on a molecular level. But I think it's also uh, very important to study the uh, uh, the study of the nerve in the context of its environment. And so what's emerging is that it's a, quite a complex pathophysiology. There are a number of different factors that are potentially interacting within the neuron. There's, in addition to genetic factors, mm, there are problems with the mitochond mitochondria, which are cells uh, or which are uh, organelles or uh, structures within the nerve that are important for uh, feeding the nerve, important for providing uh, energy. There are problems with transport from the uh, head to the tail and back from the tail to the head. There are problems in maintaining the electrical uh, properties of the nerve. Uh, and then going out of the nerve, uh, what's important is that these so-called supporting cells, which were thought to be not that important, uh, are becoming quite important uh, in motor neuron disease. One of those is the astrocytes, which, are very po uh, which is a very popular cell within the central nervous system. That's important in, in regulating glutamate. And glutamate excitotoxicity seems to be an important mechanism. In actual fact, the only modestly effective treatment that we have to date works by targeting this axis. But there is also importance of the inflammatory system, which I'll get onto in a second. What about mitoc uh, mitochondrial dysfunction? I'll sort of now try and delve into each of these uh, various uh, pathophysiologies and talk to you about how these, this may lead to a treatment. Certainly, there is a lot of evidence that dysfunction of this mitochondria, this energy generating um, a, a cell within the neuron, uh, is dysfunctional. There's, uh, the evidence, the number of, there's a lot of uh, lines of uh, evidence. But what's important is that mitochondrial dysfunction does not uh, exist in isolation. It interacts with other processes. It enhances glutamate excitotoxicity. It produces uh, too many radical, free radicals. Uh, it, when it's dysfunctional, it can't buffer the calcium and other important ions. So clearly, when that's not working, the nerve is not going to work properly and it'll die. Now, whether this is a primary or a secondary problem rem uh, remains to be resolved. There was a recent very big trial, Dex Premipec, uh, or the Empower study, which looked at a, uh, a, a, um, a drug called Dexpremipexol, which uh, works by trying to regulate the way that the mitochondria works. Uh, now, I know a number of my patients were part of this multi-center trial. Now, the phase two trial was, uh, uh, there were inc indications that it was successful. Unfortunately, the phase three trial was, uh, was very unsuccessful, which was quite disappointing, <coughs> suggesting that sort of just targeting the mitochondria in isolation uh, may not be enough. But clearly, we need to go back and have a look at that trial. Maybe there were some design flaws in it. And then the glutamate excitotoxicity. Now, how does this work? Well, as I explained, the, the humans have evolved a highly sophisticated corticomotor neuronal system that con connects the brain to the motor neurons. And the greatest density of these corticomotor neuronal projections seems to be uh, in the hand. Now, that, now, this system is quite important for precise tasks, for writing, for fine finger movements, etc. Uh, and it is this system that is believed to be a conduit of, uh, of uh, of motor neuron disease. That is, something happens up here, there's cortical disinhibition and 
uh, something basically goes wrong here. And eventually what happens is that there is excessive activity of these neurons which project onto the motor neuron and they bombard the motor neuron with glutamate. At the tail end of the process, the motor neurons themselves are vulnerable for a whole range of factors and eventually the motor neuron gives up uh, and, uh, uh, and dies. Uh, and so this is the premise of the glutamate exciter toxicity theory. It's what uh, uh, Charcot believed. He believed that the motor neuron disease started here. And uh, Andrew Eisen, um, the famous Canadian uh, ALS physician in 1992, encapsulated this by saying, well, motor neuron disease is primarily a disorder of the, of the motor cortex. And that's where it begins. This is where we should be uh, focusing our efforts on. Uh, and then the motor neuron degeneration is secondary uh, to that. The counter theory was the so-called dying back hypothesis where uh, some physicians propose that uh, the disease starts here and, there are, and a toxic factor goes up to the motor neuron and destroys it. I think that theory is probably, I don't think anybody believes that theory uh, at this stage, including the proponent of that theory, Michael Swash, I think he's coming around to the fact that it's either start either starts in the brain or it's a multi-focal uh, mechanism, and we still need to uh, elucidate that. But our research through Westmead and uh, in collaboration with Professor Matthew Keenan uh, uh, was aimed at uh, really uh, trying to dissect out or trying to try to determine this in a better way. So one of the ways that we can measure brain excitability is by stimulating the brain with what's called a transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation. So you give a magnetic pulse which then electrically stimulates the brain and you send a signal and you record a response from the muscle. Uh, so there is a normal level of excitability in everybody. So people can either have a normal level of excitability, they can be inexcitable, that is no, ma no, much, no matter how much current you put through here and the max, there's a certain maximum output, uh, you, ca you cannot stimulate the uh, neurons or the nervous system can be hyperexcitable, which means you need less current. And so our research from, you, know, you can see here I've published the first paper way back in 2006, eight years ago, it's a long time ago, seems a long, it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, we found that, so these are controls up here, and this is your level of excitability. So this is what's, what's fairly normal in, uh, uh, in healthy controls, and I was one of those healthy controls. And what we find is if you look at motor neuron disease patients, they are significantly less, which means you need less current to produce that response. So things are hyper-excitable. Uh, and what was important is that this hyper-excitability seemed to be more prominent if you had more arm involvement. And we thought that was because we were just recording from the arm. It's very hard to record from a, from a throat muscle. And we haven't done that yet. We're, we're trying to develop a technique of doing that. But in addition, it seemed to be more prominent in the early stages of the disease process when uh, patients had a relative, uh, the, the, the level of disease burden was relatively less. And then what was also interesting is that it correlated with these traditional uh, markers of nerve loss, the so-called CMAP amplitude and the neurophysiological index. Now what that suggests to us is that this level of hyperexcitability here seems to be higher when there is a relative preservation uh, of your peripheral nerve or of your lower motor neurons and that perhaps that is actually driving the whole process. We, so this was your our typical ALS and that, that was uh, a, a nice set of findings and then we wanted to expand this to, see, to answer the question well if it's present in Charcot's ALS is it present in other forms of ALS. This is the flail arm variant which is the l predominantly lower motor neuron type at least clinically. So when you tap these patients reflexes they're not brisk. They're the so-called PMA forms. This predominantly affects males. Uh, it has a relatively slower disease course uh, and there was an argument as to whether this was a form of motor neuron disease. Uh, now despite the fact that their reflexes were not brisk and we didn't find any clinical upper motor neuron signs, we found that there was uh, an identical picture in terms of cortical hyperexcitability. 
They were very hyper-excitable, more, even more so than your typical uh, ALS patients, and the cortical output, that MEP amplitude, was much larger. So we've, uh, we've, we felt that cortical hyper-excitability was a, was a unique signature to motor neuron uh, uh, to motor neuron disease. And recently we've published papers where we found that Rilluzol can, can uh, slightly normalize uh, that level of hyperexcitability. Now, what about the genes? So we next looked at uh, genetic forms of uh, ALS and in collaboration with Professor Nicholson, who's in the audience, we um, uh, recruited a, a number of families with the superoxide dismutase 1 gene. This is the first gene that was uh, described in ALS and it was probably the, the commonest um, gene at that time. Recently, um, the C9 off gene is taken uh, over and I'll talk about that in, in a moment. So the SOD1 gene you, uh, comprised about 10% of all uh, cases, about 20% of all familial uh, cases, and there are at, at last count, there were over 150 different uh, mutations, perhaps even uh, more now. But despite the fact that this was that the mutation was described in '93, we still don't quite understand how uh, the the SOD1 gene produces the disease, whether it's a toxic gain of function uh, or whether it's something uh, else. So we wanted to explore this issue as to whether there is hyperexcitability, whether this. Uh, uh, glutamate excitotoxic process was indeed seen in, uh, ALS, in, this, in this form of ALS, and indeed it was. Uh, the, these are the familial sod ones here. They were indistinguishable from the apparently sporadic ALS patients. But what was interesting, when we studied the asymptomatic mutation carriers, that is, family members who had the gene but did not have the disease, their level of excitability was was normal. Uh, in all but a couple of patients, uh, subjects or controls, uh, or rather subjects that we studied at that time, there were three people that um, were clinically normal at the time that we saw them. But within these two men here, within six months of this study, they went on to develop motor neuron disease starting in the leg. Uh, and when we went back and looked at their level of hyperexcitability, uh, it was actually uh, present. Uh, and then this third person here was followed for a period of three years and we found that there was a 40% increase in hyperexcitability from study one to study two. And in 2007 here, this person developed uh, motor neuron uh, disease. So that to us suggested that hyperexcitability may be a pre a factor that predates or develops before the onset of motor neuron degeneration, corroborating uh, some animal studies that had suggested that in the SOD1 mouse model, the first change occurs up in the cortex. But these studies are still ongoing and we need to further verify them. Now, since then, or after that, uh, Professor Garth Nicholson and Ian Blair, together with a multinational collaboration, discovered two further genes, the TDP43 and the FUS genes. These are less prominent or less frequent than the SOD1 gene, but they produce almost an identical uh, ALS phenotype with the exception of FOS. FOS seems to have a more lower motor neuron phenotype. But anyway, um, and there's been a whole range of uh, 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 ways that um, these uh, mutations uh, uh, cause the disease, but what's important, uh, the discovery of these two uh, genes heralded this sort of DNA RNA binding protein uh, theory. So these two proteins are very important in, the, uh, in helping the cell regulate the way it actually deals with its uh, DNA and the way it produces its uh, proteins, and uh, so they're, they're quite important. Um, uh, fundamental uh, proteins. Uh, and what, they've, what they found in pathological studies is, is that you have these inclusions of, of TDP uh, and FUS. So they were precipitating out. These mutations were making these proteins stickier, clogging up the cell, and the cell just couldn't work. How these cells, or how these mutations produced the uh, motor neuron disease is still not known. Uh, but perhaps one of the ways is that the cells, which are uh, these proteins, uh, which are uh, normally produced and have to get out into the uh, into the uh, cytosol to do their 
to do their work for some reason don't get there because of uh, the fact that they can't be transported. But a lot of work is being uh, done on this and uh, there have been some groups that have actually looked at ways to try and clear in try to clear out these proteins from the cells to see whether that'll be beneficial. So this is just showing where the mutations are. But what is interesting, we studied uh, uh, a family with the FOS mutation and again they had a similar picture. They were hyperexcitable. So irrespective of whether you've got your SOD1 mutation or your TDP43 or, or rather a FAS mutation, this brain sort of, this upregulation of brain uh, excite, excitability seems to be an important common uh, signature to a motor neuron uh, disease. So perhaps there are a number of different ways we get there. Maybe there's one way, we don't know. But at the output end, this hyperexcitability seems to be very important and would explain why Rilizol uh, would uh, work. And more recently, there's uh, the discovery of the CNI North gene. Uh, that was linked with a, um, a mutation on chromosome 9p21, the, the ALS FTD um, phenotype. Now this is quite important because this was probably the, the most, one of the most important uh, discoveries in understanding the in understanding where motor neuron disease fits on the spectrum of the disorder. So it was no longer just a neuromuscular disorder. It actually fitted on the continuum with a dementia, frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and so, and what, what subsequently uh, people have found, and even prior to that, but subsequently even more so, is that there are subtle changes in cognition in patients with uh, uh, motor neuron disease, especially with this mutation. There are also changes at an MRI level. So ALS is not just a disorder of the motor neurons. It affects the whole of the frontal motor system. Um, and this is just reiterating that, that there is uh, disease affecting the uh, frontal uh, lobes. Now in terms of the C9-North mutation, uh, it was really identical uh, in its in its clinical presentation to your typical sporadic uh, ALS. You know, you, you had brisk reflexes, you had uh, a progressive uh, loss of, uh, a progressive loss of uh, muscle, etc. The only thing that uh, perhaps suggested, that it, uh, the, the only clinical thing that suggested perhaps one might have seen an off mutation is if you have more behavioral or cognitive uh, problems. They seem to be a little bit more overrepresented in this, uh, in this disorder. But what is also interesting is that even if you're born with a C9 North gene, you may or may not get ALS. Some people may get ALS MND, others may get frontotemporal dementia, others may get both. So there's a lot of work now gone into trying to find out how this mutation causes disease and why there is variability uh, in the expression of disease from one family member uh, to the next. But again, cortical hyperexcitability is again a signature of this disorder, or of this mutation. Um, and that's just, I'll just skip there. Um, what is, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, basic molecular work going um, on trying to find out uh, how this disease uh, how the mutation produces the disease. We know that perhaps there's less production of this protein that's encoded by this gene um, and uh, both in the frontal cortex but also uh, at a more general level. Uh, and to date there, there, there have been at least five different types of mechanisms that have been pro uh, proposed. Uh, I won't go into them um, but um, suffice to say we don't understand how it produces uh, disease. And just uh, changing text slightly in the last 10 minutes, one of the things that uh, we've become more and more interested in uh, is the role of autoimmunity. We know that certainly from animal studies, uh, the autoimmune system does uh, harbor a neuroprotective uh, element, and that's called the, the so-called M2 type uh, 
uh, system. So when, that's, when that is uh, present, it protects the brain from uh, damage. And people have found both in, uh, other research have found both in the animal model but also in humans, that these uh, regulatory T cells, cells that sort of dampen down any excessive or abnormal uh, autoimmune activity, seem to be overexpressed and seem to be very, very high in the early stages of motor neuron disease. And then when the disease takes on a more aggressive course, it switches to a more, uh, more cytotoxic Th1, Th17, what, what one sees in, say, multiple sclerosis. Um, and um, a lot of this work has come from Stanley Appel's group, and they found that uh, the, the T regulatory proteins are higher up early in the disease, certainly in the animal model, and the more cytotoxic ones uh, are present later in the disease process. And what was important was that in patients that had a slower rate of progression, they seemed to have more T regulatory cells, whereas those people that had a faster or more accelerated course seemed to have less T regulatory cells. And there was a correlation between disease activity okay, and the presence of these regulatory cells. So if you had more regulatory cells, your rate of disease progression was slower. And that's quite exciting because if you can then find a way to try and keep these regulatory, or to keep the autoimmune or the immune system in that regulatory phase, perhaps we can slow down the disease progression even more significantly than one, what one can with uh, Rilizol. And our group at Westmead in collaboration with Professor Stewart from the Westmead Millennium Institute have been conducting these uh, studies now for the last two years. We've been looking at longitudinal studies and what we found was indeed that ALS patients and in a cross-sectional design had higher levels of T regulatory cells when compared to age and sex match controls. And we also too found in a cross-sectional design uh, that it did correlate with disease progression. Now, instead of using Stanley Appel score, we used the ALS-FRS score. So, but what was quite uh, uh, interesting is that we reproduced the figure, suggesting that irrespective of how you measure rate of disease progression, you, you find similar results, suggesting that these T regulatory cells are important in trying to control the rate of disease progression. Now, saying that, I, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, that uh, ALS is an autoimmune disorder. What I'm saying is that one of the pillars or one of the uh, factors controlling the rate of disease progression is this autoimmune system working in concert with other things, your genes, the excitotoxicity, etc. But there is a way, and quite a simple way, uh, of uh, trying to bump up the uh, regulatory system, and that's through uh, phototherapy. Uh, speaking to my dermatology colleagues, they use phototherapy for conditions like psoriasis, uh, and that's not so to give patients a nicer tan, but that's so as to control the disease by increasing the sort of the good aspect of immunity. So one of the one of the uh, trials that we're planning through uh, Westmead with uh, collaborators from both the dermatology and the immunology departments as well as the Garvin Institute is the so-called photo, what we call it, the photoneuron trial, the phototherapy for motor neuron disease trial, where we're planning to use narrowband ultraviolet B light to see whether or not you can increase the T regulatory cells in motor neuron disease patients. That's the first thing. This is in, this is in psoriasis patients. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is whether this is associated with a slower disease progression. So I'm hopeful that we'll get some NH and MRC funding for this next year. So what of the treatments? Now I've harped on about glutamate excitotoxicity. Now all of you would have heard about Rilizol. Who's taking Rilizol at the moment? Okay, so Rilizol is really the only, only effective uh, drug therapy that we have in motor neuron disease and I think over 50 different uh, trials, uh, 50 different medications have been trialed, all coming from that uh, computer in Cambridge, which, you know, it's not really paying off, I think. But Rilizol works by blocking the level of excitotoxicity. So what it does, it actually binds to the corticomotor neuron here, and it prevents 
the corticomotor neuron for, from releasing glutamate or, or reduces the amount of glutamate uh, released. It, does, it also does some other things, but that's the main mechanism of action. Now, in uh, two big trials, one published in 94 and another one published uh, in 96, we find that it definitely slows down disease progression. It prolongs survival when compared to placebo. There's about almost a 40% reduction in mortality at 21 months. Um, and um, a subgroup analysis has found that really uh, the most of the benefit for some reason is in the bulbar onset uh, patients. And the original study, the 94 study, didn't find any benefit in limb onset patients, but a subsequent study did find uh, benefit in patients with uh, limb onset and moreover they found they also tried to stratify, uh, stratify as to who would benefit the most and one of the and they came up with two groups the so-called lo low risk and the high risk group so the low risk group would benefit most from Ridizol and one of the things is is disease duration okay so if you diagnose disease this uh, MND very early on and start the patients on Ridizol you would you tend to do better and this is why it's very important that we get our diagnostic tests uh, in place uh, very early on. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, we've done some recent studies which have shown that if you give patients result, you will sort of decrease the level of cortical hyperexcitability. So this is, um, these are patients um, before Reduzol, and these are patients on Reduzol and these are normal controls. So you can see there's probably about a 30% normalization. Um, and that's po probably perhaps because Ridazol is not working at the neurodegenerative uh, spectrum, um, but rather uh, it's working at the downstream, trying to sort of uh, uh, cope with the, the, the side effects of the upstream degeneration, and that is excessive glutamate release. So the first pillar of treatment is Ridazol. And it's, and it's a fairly safe drug, um, and most, really everybody should be, should be uh, on it. I should stress that Ridazol is not going to make the nerves grow back. It's, it's neuroprotective, and when I mentioned this um, at a recent ANZAN conference, I, somebody jumped up and said, well, it's, how can it be neuroprotective? And Well, it is neuroprotective because it slows down the rate of disease progression. If you're on Ridazol, your life will be prolonged, so it must be protecting something. Uh, but in addition to Ridazol, there's a whole range of other things that need to be addressed, and these are all addressed through a multidisciplinary uh, clinic. Now, the multidisciplinary clinics are absolutely important. The, this is the state of the art in terms of caring for our MND patients, and we know from uh, studies by Ola Hardiman in Ireland that patients treated in a multidisciplinary clinic do much better both in terms of longevity of life but also quality of life when compared to uh, patients that are just managed in a general neurology clinic because we have the capability of addressing all of these things breathlessness, swallowing problems, you know, early assessment by a speech therapist and a dietitian, uh, implementing safe swallowing strategies, modifying the diet Insert, inserting a gastrostomy tube. Now, this is very, very important because some people believe, and I, I, I'm one of those, that motor neuron disease at some point is a hypermetabolic disorder. There seems to be a, a lot of patients seem to lose a lot of weight in the early stages of disease. Now, and if we can somehow slow that by replenishing the diet uh, properly through working with our dietitian and speech therapy colleagues, I think we would improve not only the quality but the longevity of life, silaria, etc., and all of these things. Um, one of the other troublesome symptoms is the pseudobulbar affect, where patients cry and laugh um, spontaneously, and it's very different to what they were like previously. There's a, slight, there's a change in personality. It's probably got to do with what's going on in the frontal cortex. The frontal cortex is, is a thing that controls our behavior. Um, now, there, one, th this is a troublesome uh, uh, symptom because it, it does affect the interactions that the patients has, have with their loved ones, with their carers, with the, the physicians. Uh, there was a drug, uh, dextrametorphan plus quinidine, uh, now, dextromethorphan is a 
you're, yes, you're right, glutamate antagonist, and that was shown to significantly reduce um, the pseudobulbar affect uh, when compared to no treatment. The problem is, is that we, we dextromethorphan, you have to combine it with quinidine because otherwise it just gets metabolized in the, in the stomach. So, but quinidine has recently been taken off the market in Australia, so we, we really can't use this. So what we're trying to now use are other um, antidepressants, things like uh, amitriptyline and, and cipramil and other things. So, um, but that is a very trouble, troublesome symptom.